Hello, everyone. Human mind is always intrigued by the unknown, and oceans remain one of the greatest mysteries on the planet. But for me, oceans are even more mysterious for the fact that I don't know how to swim, so I've never explored it myself. But last year, I decided to go to Florida for an underwater explanatory adventure, aka scuba diving. However, I was greeted by this signboard at the beach. Florida red tide present. Most of the intelligent people and scientists in the auditorium right now would sense the gravity of the situation by just looking at this signboard. But I'll be very honest, I didn't know much about Florida red tide, so I was intrigued. I did some research and found out that a red tide or harmful algal bloom occurs when colonies of algae grow in crazy high concentrations and produce toxins that affect marine life as well as public health. In Florida and in Gulf of Mexico, the species that causes most of the harmful algal bloom events is Carinia brevis, which in high concentration discolors water a reddish-brown hue and hence the name red tide. It is also associated with massive fish kills and also affects public health. While I was reading about Florida red tide, I came across this HAB sampling data set, which is huge and was collected and maintained by Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation. The data set contains more than 100,000 HAB sampling records along the coast of Florida from 1954 to present. To analyze if my data set has any spatial or temporal patterns, I exported this entire data set into my Arc, uh, ArcGIS Pro. To explore the spread of the sampling effort in time, I used a simple bar chart. As you can see here, the number of observations vary widely in the span of 65 years. There are gaps in the data set, and some years are well sampled than the others. So for my analysis, I decided to extract only the recent 10 years of data set, that is from 20, uh, 2008 to 2017, because I thought the number of observations were more consistent in these recent years. So I took this data set and categorized into two categories, absence and presence. What this means is that if a location was sampled positive for Karenia brevis cell, I marked it as an as a presence of harmful algal bloom, and if not, it was marked as absence. At this point, I started looking at the map for some spatial patterns. There's relatively a stronger presence of HAB along the southwestern Florida, extending all the way up to embayment area in the northwest. But do these areas get HABs all the time? Is there any seasonal or, say, annual pattern in how HABs occur at these locations. To explore my data in time, I used a simple chart called Data Clock in Pro, which is, which is very new. And as the name suggests, a data clock gives a snapshot of your data set in time. So I aggregated my HAB's presence over 10 years to decipher if there's any seasonal or perhaps an annual pattern. A quick glance would tell you that the HAB events are more persistent in the months of fall. This observation is quite consistent with what I have read about harmful algal blooms. They tend to occur mostly in the months of September to November, and their extent and duration varies based on physical and climatic conditions. So as you can see, for some years, the bloom stay was very short-lived, but in most recent years, they stayed for a little longer than usual. After having this spatial and temporal understanding of my data set, I need, uh, the next very obvious question was, where are these locations, um, do these locations get um, harmful algal blooms all the time, or is there any temporal pattern on how these harmful algal blooms occur at a particular location? To answer these space and time conundrums, there's a solution in Pro called Create Space-Time Cube by Aggregating Points. So before I tell you about how this tool works, I'm just going to quickly take a detour and talk about uh, what this tool does. So all my data set on a map is two-dimensional, having an x and a y coordinate. 
this tool adds a third dimension to my data set, which is time. So now we can analyze space and time simultaneously. The output of the create space-time cube by aggregating points looks like this cube. You can specify the spatial as well as temporal extent of each of these bins, and you can choose to fill each of these bins with either the sum, average, minimum, maximum of all these data points in each of these cubes. So I'll go ahead and run this create space-time create space-time cube by aggregating points. And I would like to aggregate my points in one-year intervals over 15 kilometers spatial extent bin. And at this point, I'll go ahead and run this tool. And I want to fill my bins with the presence of harmful algal bloom events. So if there's any missing data in, in my entire data set, which is very common in monitoring and sampling data sets, I'd like to fill those bins with spatial and temporal neighbors so that um, if I have any missing data, I, it, it doesn't create any bias in my analysis. So if I'd like to see the output of this 3D tool, um, I'll add a 3D scene layer. And you know what? The best way to visualize a space-time cube in 3D is to use this tool, which is very conveniently named Visualize Space-Time Cube in 3D. So I use the same hab cube that I just created for my data set. My cube variable is my presence of algal bloom events, and my display theme is values. So if I run this tool, uh, which takes like two seconds, but I'll just go ahead and show you how the output looks like. This is how the output of the tool looks like. And since I chose a temporal aggregation of one year, so that means each of these bin they show me my one year worth of data in my 10-year analysis. Since human beings are programmed to look for patterns as soon as they see a set of points on map, I am no exception, and I started to look for patterns as soon as I saw this amazing 3D visualization. I got so excited, and I started looking into each location to see if I can see any temporal trend. Are these HABs events um, do these have events have upward trend at a particular location or perhaps a downward trend? I did it for a couple of locations until I realized that I was only a statistician and not a computer, so I couldn't do it for all the locations. So to analyze the overall trend of each of these locations in time, I used a visualized space-time cube in 2D tool, which is in um, space-time pattern mining toolbox, and if I go ahead and open this tool, I'm using the same um, time, space-time cube that I just created. That is the Hab cube. I, I, I should have been more created with the name, but uh, cube variable is still my presence variable. And if you select trend as your display theme, the tool runs Mencandle statistics on each of these locations. So instead of me trying to figure out each location's trend, the output of the tool gives me the temporal trend along with statistical significance. So if I just close this layer, you can see the output of the tool. The dark purple locations here, you can see an upward trend with 99% confidence. Doesn't it feel great that someone else could do these tedious calculations for you and you can just see the results? The results were quite consistent with my earlier spatial analysis. The area of southwestern Florida, this, this is near Tampa Bay, had mostly an upward trend. What I thought was an interesting observation was this area. This is the embayment area behind the barrier islands like the Apolichicola Bay and St. George Sound, where the tributaries drain to. So because of the nutrient-rich water present here, these halves can grow off of these nutrients, and this upward trend kind of makes sense to me. Now that I know the overall temporal trend at each of the location, I want to go one step deeper into my analysis and find out clusters with similar temporal signatures across time. What I'm getting at is even though this tool told me about the overall temporal trend at a location A and B, both have an upward trend, but the missing piece of information is, do these locations A and location B also have similar values across time? 
To do this analysis, I'll use a tool in Pro called Time Series Clustering. As the name suggests, the tool clusters location based on, um, based on the location which have similar um, signatures in time. So if, if I go ahead and open this tool, I'll use the same hab cube that I have been using since um, the very beginning, the same variable. There are two ways you can run this tool. Either you can ch um, select characteristic of interest as value or as profile. But if you choose your va um, the interest value as profile, the clustering will be based on common shape of each of these locations time series. But for now, in my analysis, I'm more interested in finding cluster based on values. So I'll go ahead and run this tool. You can also specify the output name for your table so that the charts can be automatically created for you. So the output of this tool shows four different time series clusters. To be able to see the time series of each of these clusters, I'll go ahead and make use of the chart that was automatically created for me. This is an interesting observation where you can see that all these clusters, they have a similar profile in time. They all kind of have a peak in 2013 and a, in 2017 and a dip in 2015. If you see all these colors, the, the blue one is the background clusters. So if you like to find where these locations are on your map, you will see, and it's, this is no surprise, that it, these are all up here in, in the southwestern Florida, and some of them are here in the embayment area. So at this point, I was so happy to see my consistent spatial and temporal patterns in all of these tools output. Now that I've found out the clusters with similar values across time, the last piece of information that I'm interested in is to find the locations or clusters where high algal bloom occurrences are. A very popular tool in spatial statistics toolbox called Hotspot Analysis does the job of finding statistically significant spatial clusters of high and low values. We refer to the clusters of high values as hotspots and clusters of low values as cold spots. Hotspot analysis tool runs Getis or GI star statistics on my two-dimensional data to find these hot and cold spots. Conceptually, the tool takes each feature and defines a neighborhood around that feature. It takes the entire neighborhood and compares the neighborhood with the entire study area. So if the neighborhood is statistically significantly higher than your entire study area, it is marked as a hotspot. And if it if it is statistically significantly lower than your entire study area, the feature is marked as a cold spot. But now imagine doing all these things in 3D, because now you not only have spatial neighbors, but you have neighbors in time, you have temporal neighbors. So to make life easier, there's a tool in Pro called Emerging Hotspot Analysis, which is an equivalent of um, hotspot analysis, but in 3D. So at this point, I will again use the same cube, the hab cube. My analysis variable is the same algae presence. And personally, I like k nearest neighbor methods to define my spatial, um, spatial neighborhood because I can explicitly specify how many neighbors um, are there in my neighborhood. So since I have used hexagon cubes, uh, hexagon bins, I'll go ahead and use a number of spatial neighbors as six and I'll just have the entire thing as default, and just run the queue. The thing that I like about this tool, in, apart from its statistics, is that it applies a beautiful symbology to my output map. Here you can see three distinct patterns. The one in the red is a new hotspot. What this means is that this location was never a statistically significant hotspot until the very last time step. There are, these are the areas of concern because you wouldn't want to see new places with high Halgal bloom events. The dark brown locations are consecutive hotspots, and these patchy little areas, these are sporadic, means they were on and off hotspots. And if you are what you see is what you believe kind of a person like me, I'll show you a little trick on how you can actually see these hotspots in time. 
So if I go to my 3D scene layer again, the amazing thing about running this analysis on a cube is that the results get stored in the cube itself. So if I run my visualized space-time cube in 3D, but this time, instead of my display theme as value, if I choose hot and cold results, the output would look like this. So when I lay my 3D output on the top of my 2D map, I would see exactly why these locations are new hotspots, sporadic and consecutive. Zooming into this location, I can see that this location was never a hotspot prior to my last time step run. However, here you can see in sporadic, this location was, was never a hotspot for several years, but then it was a hotspot, and then it wasn't a hotspot. So it was kind of an on and off. But here in my consecutive hotspots, you can see it was consecutively hotspot for my recent years. So after completing this analysis, I, I knew much more about Florida red tide in space and time. The best I could do with my uh, analysis is that I, I, I planned my vacation better. So statistically speaking, I wouldn't have to see the beach closure sign again. But on a serious note, if these powerful tools are used by domain experts, oceanographer, scientists, policymaker, they can really transform how important decisions are made. Thank you for listening.